Appreciate y'all tuning in. My name is Jacob Thornton. This is the Bible Search Program. Today, we're going to be continuing the topic regarding the Sabbath, the Sabbath day versus the Sunday. Yesterday, we had a lot of information in which we went over regarding the Sabbath day and who it was for, and we learned that it was for Israel. It's not for God's New Testament people. The Sabbath day was a day for God's Old Testament people. Hope y'all are having a nice morning. Uh, If you are watching, go ahead and comment, say good morning. Uh, It'll show up on the screen here, get some good communication going. And you can call in live anytime. It's 530-358-0400. And today's topic is concerning the Sabbath day. And is it the day in which Christians, members of the church of Christ, is it the day in which members of the body of Christ are commanded to observe? And we're going to find no. It's not. And what is the day then? Well, it's Sunday. And one of the things which a lot of people say, and it's not true, is that the Catholic Church changed the Sabbath to Sunday. That somehow the the Catholic Church changed the Sabbath to the first day of the week. Now, that's just not even anywhere near scriptural. The Bible teaches that There's a distinction made in the New Testament between the Sabbath and the first day of the week. All you have to do in the New Testament regarding the resurrection of Jesus is we learn that the resurrection of Jesus occurred on the first day of the week, and it was after the Sabbath. Mark chapter 16, verse 1, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And so even at the resurrection of Jesus, there's a distinction made in the Bible between the Sabbath and the first day of the week. And we learn in the Bible that the disciples, meaning the church, right? Acts chapter 11, verse 26, talks about the church, And it says the disciples, right, who are members of the church were called Christians. And so we learn the church is made up of disciples who are called Christians and the church is made up of Christians. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we learn upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Well, that's the church coming together. That is the Christians coming together on the first day of the week for the purpose of breaking bread. And so there's a distinction made. A lot of people think, good morning. I appreciate you tuning in, Uh, Lori. Everyone else watching also, you can go ahead and comment good morning. Grab your cup of coffee as we take a look at God's word regarding the Sabbath day versus Sunday. 
the seventh day versus the first day of the week. And we learn that the Catholic Church is not the institution which placed a difference between the Sabbath and the first day of the week. And they didn't change the Sabbath to the first day of the week because the Bible talks about after the Sabbath on the first day of the week, they came to Jesus's tomb. And so the Bible teaches there's a difference between the Sabbath and the first day of the week. And at no time was the Sabbath ever, ever made the first day of the week. Now, the importance under the Old Testament of observing a day was the Sabbath, which is Saturday. But the New Testament, the importance for the day of the week in which Christians are to come together, as stated in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, is the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And yesterday, uh, we had a question, and I thought about it a little bit, and uh, Lori asked the question, and rightly so. What about a person today, a Christian, who desires to observe the Sabbath? Can they be right with God? And in my head, you know, what I think is, are, are when asking that question, simply what, what did they do in the Old Testament on the Sabbath? Well, they didn't work. So can a Christian not work on the Sabbath? Can they not work on Saturday and be right with God? Appreciate you tuning in. Uh, my dad, Dave, can a person decide, hey, I'm not going to work on Saturday, right? Can they do that and, and be right with God? Well, as long as they're providing for their household um, and working the other days a week, as Second Thessalonians chapter 3 says, if any man does not work, neither shall he eat. So if you decide to take a day off of work, well, you need to make sure that the other days of the week you are working to provide for yourself, your family, and the problem you run into is when you decide to make that a law, right? I don't work Saturday. I haven't worked a Saturday in probably three years. And my wife, she's worked some Saturdays. Now, if I have said you know, to myself, well, I'm not going to work Saturdays, and I'm going to use that as a day of rest for spiritual things, for studying the Bible, for prayer, and for evangelism. If I decide to do that, but then, hey, look, my wife's going out the door to go to work. Can I therefore tell her, hey, you're now condemned because you're going to work on a Saturday? No, I cannot. There's no law under the New Testament which says that a person cannot work on a Saturday. Under the Old Testament, that was a law, but that was only for the children of Israel. Now, under the New Testament, if a person decides, it doesn't even have to be a Saturday, right? Uh, it can be any day of the week which a person decides hey, I don't want to work on this day because I'm going to dedicate this day to spiritual things, right? To, to be thankful to God, um, to focus on spirituality and to uh, focus on prayer and Bible study and evangelism. Can a person do that and with any day of the week? Yeah, they can. I stated before, as long as they're not violating 2 Thessalonians verse 3, or not verse 3, chapter 3, which says, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any man would not work, neither shall he eat. And so under the New Testament, we have the command to work just like under the Old Testament. But under the New Testament, there is no command which says you can work, but don't work on this day. You see, under the Old Testament, they were said they were told to work, but it was specifically commanded to them. You can work, but not on the seventh day. Well, under the New Testament, we don't have that command. Uh, we have a comment from Lori. Many Sabbatarians, which are those who hold to the law still in place that a person must observe the Sabbath. Many Sabbatarians forget. What they forget is that there were many Sabbaths and several of them fell on the first day of the week, such as Pentecost. So even under the old law, God commanded observance of the first day of the week. As you said yesterday from the scripture, these were shadows of Christ and his law. So I, I would need to study more regarding the Sabbath. I only know of Sabbath occurring on uh, Saturday because the Sabbath is the day pictured of the day of rest. So I have to do some study and some Sabbaths uh, fell on the first day of the week. But... Right. Those were all shadows. Even if the Sabbath somehow did fall on the first day of the week, if it was a reference to some type of festival or something, um, 
those were all part of the old law and we're not required to to keep those. And if we begin pooling those verses, those traditions from them, then we're going to run into some trouble because we today don't obey Moses. We obey Jesus. And even Moses spoke about the time period when it said Jesus would come and Israel would need to listen to him. And anyone who didn't listen to him would be cut off from among the people, meaning they'd be destroyed. They'd have no, uh, well, they'd be destroyed first in the first century by the Romans, but they'd be cut off from the blessings as Ephesians 1, 3 says. But yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. Sabbath fell on the first day of the week. I didn't know that. Um, so I'll, I'll study that to see whether or not. But either way, yeah, under the Old Testament, they had the Feast of Weeks. And so there's different feasts which were required to be kept day by day. But under the New Testament, we're going to learn that the first day of the week has a lot of spiritual significances because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Pentecost, which is... Uh, 50 days from the Sabbath, so 49 days from the Sabbath is seven weeks, and it would land on a Saturday, but the 50th day, Pentecost, would land on the first day of the week. And so not only did Jesus rise on the first day of the week, but the church of Christ in Acts chapter 2 was established on the day of Pentecost, and that was on the first day of the week. And we also read, so it says here, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so, and this is when the church was established, and you scroll down, the Lord added to the church daily. The church was established on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says, Christians assembled together for the purpose of taking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. And so there's an importance, a significance placed on the first day of the week in the New Testament. And so under the Old Testament, we learned that it was for Israel it was revealed to Israel for Israel, and it wasn't revealed to anyone else. And as pointed out yesterday in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, where Jesus said, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Sabbath, though, was not introduced until the children of Israel left Egypt. No one was commanded to keep the Sabbath until the children of Israel left Egypt, and the only people commanded to keep it were the children of Israel. And if there were any proselytes who converted to Judaism, they too would be required to observe the Sabbath. But this was not a command for every person. And if man was made for the Sabbath— then it would have been a command given to Adam and Eve, but it wasn't. It was introduced long after when the children of Israel left Egypt. I appreciate the comment. Under the Old Testament, no Gentiles were ever commanded to keep the Sabbath, like I said, unless they were proselytes. But under the Old Testament, the Jews, they had a very specific command to keep the Sabbath, but the only command under the New Testament regarding, to, uh, regarding the Sabbath to the members of the Church of Christ is this, let no man therefore condemn you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body, meaning the church, is of Christ. The church obeys Jesus Christ. If the church obeyed Moses, well then you would have to keep these feasts, the new moon, the Sabbath. You'd have to obey the shadow. However, we obey Jesus, and Jesus never gave us any of these commandments. And if he did, then this verse, these two verses would not be in the Bible. If we had commandment under the New Testament to observe the Sabbath, and if you are condemned for not observing the Sabbath, then this verse would not be in the Bible, which says, let no man condemn you regarding the Sabbath, right? And under the Old Testament, and a lot of people, we went over this yesterday, where a lot of people say you have to observe the Sabbath. However, they only observe partial of that law because the second part of that law said if anyone does not observe the Sabbath, they shall be put to death. So you have in the individuals trying to bind the Sabbath, but they're only trying to bind half of the verse. Because if you read that same verse, which says to keep the Sabbath holy, the same verse says to 
put to death anyone who violates the Sabbath. So you have individuals picking and choosing, and they're looking in the Old Testament. Notice, and, and this is what Christians need to do. They need to look into the New Testament for our teachings. We don't observe a teaching just because it's found in the Old Testament. Jesus told his disciples that when the new covenant would begin and they would begin teaching all nations, Jesus said, teach them, right? Teach them to observe. So here's what the nations are commanded to observe. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so we don't observe the law of Moses. We observe what Jesus has commanded us. And there's distinctions made in the scripture between Moses and and Jesus and the law that was delivered by Moses and the law which was delivered by Jesus. And so if a, a Christian individual wants to observe a certain day of the week for a certain reason, they could if they wanted to, but they could not bind that observance of that day to another individual. And I stated before, if say, for example, say Friday, say I wanted to take off, uh, I wanted to not work on Fridays, I'd be working five to six days out of the week. I wanted to take off Fridays and devote that day for spiritual purposes. Could I then bind that day on my spouse or another Christian? No, you can't. But could I devote that day to the Lord for spiritual purposes? I sure could. Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine 29 tells us Jesus is our rest. And in Hebrews chapter four, so... The Bible teaches, right, Jesus can give us rest for our souls. His teachings are not hard to understand or believe, although sometimes they are difficult to obey because it requires effort and doing the right thing. And it might cause you to stir up division, not because you're a problem or you're starting problems, but it's because when a Christian teaches the truth or tries to do the right thing and a problem arises out of that, that's because a problem already existed. They're not causing a problem. They're not starting a problem. A problem already existed and the Christian is trying to make that problem into a solution, right? In Hebrews chapter four, we learn that there is a day of rest for the Christian and it's not Saturday, it's heaven when Jesus comes from heaven that second time. And notice what it says. For we which have believed do enter into that rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, the Sabbath day, the seventh day is a picture of God's eternal rest. And it goes on, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, and it's an eternal rest, it's a picture of heaven, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter, entered not in because of unbelief. This is reference to the generation of Israelites led out of Egypt who died in the wilderness because they were in rebellion against God. And it says, Again, he limited, limiteth a day, a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. And Joshua was before David. And so if Joshua gave them the promised rest, then why would David come along later and talk about a day of rest? Right? That's because there remains a day of rest. That's what it says. Therefore remaineth there uh, a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. And so the rest for Christians is not the seventh day of the week, but it's a picture of heaven. It's a picture of uh, this eternal rest. Let's see. Right. So 
The New Testament, even here, it talks about the seventh day. And if Christians were required to keep the Sabbath day, then this would be a good place because it mentions the under the New Testament, here's a mention of the seventh day of the week, but it never mentions Christians to keep that day of rest. But it says we're laboring, we're working for and toward the day of rest, which we will enter into that eternal state. <clears throat> there, therefore, remaineth a rest to the people of God. And this is in the future. If y'all want to call in, it's 530-358-0400. What we are learning about is the Sabbath day and how that was for the Old Testament uh, Israelites. And it's not for the New Testament Christians. And the day of rest commanded for the Christians is this day of rest in which we are hoping to achieve. And it remains, it says, for the people of God. But if individuals do not believe then that they will not be able to enter in. And it's not simply believe only, but it's the idea of faith. And because you have a living faith in the teachings of the gospel, well, you're going to do those things, which the gospel says, as Jesus said in, I think it's Matthew chapter seven, where Jesus said, uh, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. And so, this is a picture of belief in God. Here's a picture of New Testament faith, the person who obeys the will of the Father because they believe the will of the Father. And the person who has a belief, then they will enter into that rest, that eternal rest. And under the New Testament, what we learn is that Jews and Gentiles are required to follow the same law, and it's the law of Christ. And if under the New Testament, if Gentiles by commandment are not required to keep the Sabbath, well, then neither are the Jews. We have the same teachings. And if the Jews under the New Testament, right, not the Old Testament, we know under the Old Testament that the Jews were required to keep the Sabbath, but if the Jews under the New Testament were commanded to keep the Sabbath, well, Jesus said to teach all nations whatsoever he commanded, and the nation should observe his commandments. So if the Jews are observing that command, then guess what? That's a command for the Gentiles also. But there is no command under the New Testament for the Jew or Gentile to observe the Sabbath. And we learn from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that Jews and Gentiles, those instructed by the spirit to be baptized into the body of Christ. Those who are baptized into the body are made to drink into the same spirit, meaning we have the same teachings. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. This means by the instructions of the Holy Spirit, an individual is water baptized into the body, which is the church, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free, right? Either you're a slave or not. And have all been made to drink into one spirit. This is the idea. We have all the same teachings for the Jew and for the Gentile. There is no difference between the two. God pours out his grace upon Jew and Gentile. Romans 10, 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. <clears throat> for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. They don't have two separate laws. They have the same law in Acts chapter 15, verse 7 through 9, tells us. This is Peter recounting the event of Cornelius's conversion. And he says that God gave them the Holy Spirit to prove that they could be justified by faith. Now, when it says here, we're going to read that God gave them the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean they were saved at that moment. It just means that them receiving the Holy Spirit was evidence that they could be saved by New Testament faith. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's reference first to the house of Cornelius and God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness giving them the Holy Ghost, even as unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And God gave them the Holy Spirit, Cornelius and his household, to show 
that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, and that they could be baptized to receive the forgiveness of their sins to be purified by faith. And look what he says. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So the house of Cornelius received the Holy Spirit to prove to the Jews that the Gentiles could now be purified by faith. Just because Cornelius and his household received the Holy Spirit does not mean that they were already at that time purified by faith, but they needed to be baptized. Why did they need to be baptized? Well, because the command to the Jews on the day of Pentecost was to be baptized for the remission of sins. And so if it's a command for the Jews, guess what? It's also a command for the Gentiles. And this is the house of Cornelius. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Well, that's Acts 2.38. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord. Here's baptism in the name of the Lord being a command in Acts chapter 2 to the Jews and in Acts chapter 10 to the Gentiles. Well, why is that? Well, because both are under the same law. Both have the same instructions. And what you won't find is the Jews being commanded under the New Testament to observe the Sabbath. And for that fact, the Gentiles don't have that command either. And likewise, you don't have any commandment under the New Testament for a Gentile to keep the Sabbath. And of necessity, the, the Jews don't have that teaching also. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Uh, you go ahead and say good morning. It'll pop up below. Hope everyone's having a nice day. Help prepare for the day with some Bible study. And this is regarding the Sabbath and the first day of the week. And you might ask the question, and this is, it's beautiful that God knows the future and he has revealed, as the New Testament says, everything that pertains to life and godliness. So anything that could become a false doctrine, God has revealed to prepare us against it in order that we might not be deceived by false teachings. And that's what Ephesians uh, chapter, is it four? I think, I think so. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 through 14, we read, well, let's start with 11, that God gave the apostles and the prophets, right? We, we have their writings here. We have the writings. This is the writing here of an apostle. Just because the apostles and the prophets are not alive today does not mean that they're not important. They don't have to be on the earth to be important. They were on the earth, and that's what made them have their importance, Jesus Christ today is not on the earth. Is he therefore not important? No, he is because of what he did on the earth. And we don't have apostles or prophets alive today, but that doesn't mean that their office is of no significance, but God gave the apostles and the prophets and all these teachers to reveal the teachings that we need to perfect us, to build up the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ, to bring every individual into the unity of faith. And then it says here that we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. And individuals come up with false teachings. And the scriptures have been revealed to prepare us against the false teachings of men that we might not be persuaded. Now, in Colossians, it's just incredible that what they were doing 2,000 years ago is what false teachers today are doing also. 2,000 years ago, you had individuals teaching Christians, members of the church of Christ, that they needed to observe the Sabbath. And Paul writes to the Colossians and says, that's not true. Don't let anyone condemn you for not observing the Sabbath, right? You obey Jesus Christ. The body, the church is of Christ. You obey Christ. You don't obey Moses and you don't listen to those false teachers who are condemning you for not observing a Sabbath. It's not part of the New Testament, and we have individuals today who fall under the same category of these false teachers trying to condemn individuals for not observing the Sabbath. Are they going to put you to death? That was part of observing the Sabbath. No, they're not. We learn, and this is why you have to be careful. You know, someone might ask a question, Jake, can a person observe the Sabbath under the New Testament? And I would have to ask you, what do you mean by that? Are you asking if a person can choose willingly not to work on a Saturday, right? And as stated before, as long as they're not violating the command, which uh, tells us to work, you know, if you don't, if you don't have a job, well, 
then the Sabbath, like the Sabbath day is meant for not working. So basically every day would be your, your day of rest, right? Because you're not even working at all, but you need a job. And so if a person says, can a person take a day off of work? Yeah, they can. But the problem is, is when you try to look for your justification for the Sabbath, right? Anyone, you could take off any day of the week, a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday. And when an individual says they keep the Sabbath, well, you run into this problem where you might fall into the danger of trying to bring over the commandments from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And so it's possible for a Christian under the New Testament to fall from grace. Well, we're saved by grace. So this means you fall from salvation if they are reaching back into the Old Testament law and bringing those commandments over. They're two different laws. We're not under the same law. It's not the same. They're, they might be similar in some sorts, but those laws are not the same. The old law and the new law are not the same laws. And so it'd be a danger for anyone to try to look back in the Old Testament and bring those laws into the New Testament and try to bind them on others. So can a person choose to work five or six days out of the week and choose to use Saturday as a day that they take off work? Sure. But is a command is it a commandment for everyone? No, it's not. It sure isn't. You know, as I stated before, I have every Saturday off and there's times where my wife works on a Saturday. She's not condemned because she works on a Saturday. And if an individual tried to condemn her for it, the Bible doesn't. And so they're condemning where Christ has not condemned. It'd be like the Pharisees where they condemned Jesus and his disciples for walking through the field on the Sabbath day and they were plucking the, the heads of the, the grain or the corn and they were eating it. And they said, you're doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath. But that was lawful on the Sabbath. This, the law allowed you to walk through a field and pluck it. You just couldn't take out the, uh, the scythe or uh, what it was and you couldn't harvest on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees were condemning Jesus for something which deserved no condemnation. No law was broken. And so for individuals to tell you that you're being condemned by God for not keeping the Sabbath under the New Testament, they're falling under the same category as the Pharisees and they're condemning the innocent. And that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees, that they have condemned the innocent. We obey Jesus, not Moses. Acts chapter 3, verse 23 it shall come to pass every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed among the people. Verse 22, Moses truly said unto the fathers of prophets shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, that's reference to the Messiah, like unto me, well, Moses was a lawgiver and the Christ, the Messiah, this prophet that would be risen up from among the children of Israel. Israel was no longer to listen to Moses, but they were to listen to Christ. Now under the New Testament, Christ tells us not to listen to Moses right? It's a different law. So if an individual wants to listen to Moses, well, then they're going to have to listen to Christ. And that's what um, Jesus said. Let's see. Jesus, when telling the Jews regarding Moses, said that Moses spoke about him. I'm trying to find a verse. John 5, 46. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. If an individual wants to believe in a Moses, well, they're going to have to believe in the one who Moses said was coming. And if a person believes in Moses, they're going to have to listen to the person who Moses said would be coming. And that's Jesus. And we are called to obey Jesus, not Moses. Someone might ask the question, why did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Well, Jesus was born under the law. He was born a Jew. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, 
right? Jesus was born of a virgin. The woman was Mary, who he was born from, made under the law. Jesus was a Jew made under the law, but we learn Jesus was born under the law, but that handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, was taken out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus was born under the law, as Galatians 4, 5 says, to redeem individuals from the law. Trying to find the verse here. Jesus abolished in his flesh, right, nailing it to the cross, the law of commandments and ordinances. So Jesus was born under the law, and Jesus fulfilled the law, and when Jesus died, that law is seen as being fulfilled. And the new law was given, it would have been, what, 53 days later, because you have Jesus dead for three days, he rose the third day. He walked the earth for 40 days, and then after 10 days, after his ascension, the church was established, and the new law went forth. So 3 plus 40 plus 10 is 53. And so 53 days after Jesus' death, the new law went forth. So Jesus was born under the law, he fulfilled the law, and he removed it through his death, and a new law was brought into place 53 days later. We are not under the law. Individuals might think, hey, we're still under the law. No, we're not. Look what it says, Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. Very plain, very simple to understand. Galatians 5, 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. We're not under the condemnation of the law. We're under the grace of the New Testament. And Christians, not under the law of Moses, Christians who were under the New Testament were condemned for trying to be under the law. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Christians are not encouraged to have a desire to be under the law. They're not under the law. They're under the New Testament. And they're not, we're not encouraged to bring over those Old Testament teachings, those Old Testament laws for Israel into the laws delivered by Jesus to his apostles and prophets. And you might ask, why did the Jewish Christians, we're going to read, why did the Jewish Christians in the book of Acts go into the synagogues? Well, Oh, we have a comment from Richard. Appreciate you tuning in. Good morning, Jacob. Please expound on Colossians 2.14. Okay, I'll go, th I'll go there now because this is going to be a point I'll make and then I got to go to the book of Acts for some examples. It says, Jesus blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And so an individual, when examined next to the law of Moses, everyone falls short, right? Everyone who reaches an age of accountability falls short to what the law of Moses stated and the law of Moses had no actual forgiveness under that covenant. Now they were forgiven, but it's only in light of the fact that the Messiah would come and shed his blood. But under the Old Testament, it says um, they had a conscience of sins. There was a remembrance again of sins every year. And the reason why for it is not possible that the blood of Bulls and goats should take away sins. And so this law, the law of Moses, this law condemned individuals. And even you have the law of sin and death, which even applies to Gentiles, because there are laws set in place from God who Gentiles never under the law could violate and fall short to the glory of God. But Colossians 2.14 the and what he's trying to do here is he's trying to tell these Christians in the Church of Christ at Colossae, because in the first century, a lot of Jewish false teachers tried to convert the Christians to Judaism and bring over these laws from the Old Testament and command these Christians to obey. And so Paul is writing to them, instructing them, don't follow the old law. The old law has already been fulfilled and done away with, 
right? There's no need for you to obey that old law. And if you try to obey that old law, well, it's against you. It's contrary to you. It's only going to condemn you. So Jesus, knowing that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins, Jesus offered his body and his blood for our sins. And it says, um, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. This is all part of the old law. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down on the right hand of God. Jesus made the sacrifice for our sins. And Colossians 2.14 explains that the law of Moses was, is not a superior law to the law of Christ. Under the New Testament, the new covenant is much better established upon better promises. And Jesus, through his death, fulfilled that old law in order to bring us about a new law. And as is it Hebrews. Hebrews 9. 16 and 17, it says, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. So the New Testament could not come into force without the death of someone. And it says, for a testament is of forth after is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. The Old Testament even, it says, was dedicated with blood. Whereupon either the first testament was dedicated without blood. And it gives an example of Moses shedding blood to, uh, to enact, the, to bring into effect the old covenant. And the new covenant was brought into effect with the death of Christ, right? His shedding of blood. The new covenant could not come into effect without the shedding of blood. And Colossians 2.14 tells us that old covenant, which was brought into effect by the shedding of animal blood, was nailed to the cross, and therefore that old covenant's over with. And because we have a testator that dies, well, we're going to be preparing, preparing now for a new covenant, a new testament, because now the testator died, and we're no longer under that old testament, but now we're under the new testament because the testator died. And this law was taken away at the cross. And therefore, because this law, this law contained holy days, certain foods and drinks that you had to uh, partake of, you had to observe under the law, the new moon and the Sabbath days. But because that law, that testament was nailed to the cross, the testator died, we're brought under a new law. Well, the new law doesn't condemn you for not partaking in these things. That's why it says, let no man therefore condemn you regarding these things which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body, the church, is of Christ. The church obeys Jesus Christ, not the law of Moses. Jesus came to redeem individuals from the law of Moses because the law of Moses only condemned a person. It didn't offer any actual forgiveness because the blood of bulls and goats, which were shed under the Old Testament, could not forgive sins. And that's what the covenant was introduced with, is the blood of bulls and goats, but the New Testament was introduced with the blood of Jesus Christ. Hopefully that helped answer your question. I appreciate that. Good morning. And what we were going to learn is that why did the apostles and the Christians in the first century go into synagogues on the Sabbath day if you're not required to observe the Sabbath? Well, look what Paul says. Unto the Jews, I became as a Jew. Well, what would the Jews be doing on a Sabbath day? Well, they'd be going into the synagogue. So this is the idea of you're trying to help convert individuals and you go to where they are to convert them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews, right? To them that are under the law, he became as one under the law that he might gain those who are under the law. That's reference to the Jews. And so it'd be like, you know, say, for example, a denomination in your community has Bible studies on Tuesday. So you join in on their Bible studies, not because you're fellowshipping with them, but because you're trying to convert some individuals to the truth. 
Now, just because they assembled with the Jews in a synagogue under the New Testament does not mean that they were fellowshipping with those Jews. It just means they're trying to teach them. And that's exactly every time that you read that the Christians, members of the church, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, it was to teach those individuals and to convert them to Christ that they might realize they're no longer under the law, but now there's a new law in effect because the testator died. It says, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And some verses say, look, or some people say, look, it says that they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Why did they go on in the synagogue on the Sabbath day if you're not required to? Well, Here's for the purpose why. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And so Paul stood up, right, and addressed them, men of Israel, ye that fear God, give audience. And he ends up telling them about Jesus. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus. And he tells them about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus fulfilling the promises which were spoken uh, to David. And you might ask, you know, the question was, is why did they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath? Well, that's because that's where the Jews were on that Saturday. And they didn't go in there to fellowship with them. They went in there to convert them to Jesus Christ. And that's with all the examples we're going to see. Verse 44 and 45 of the same chapter the next Sabbath day came also the whole city to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken of by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And so the Christians were not fellowshipping with the unbelieving Jews on the Sabbath, but they were teaching them. And the individuals who were not converted, they did not like the Christians. And so the only reason that they came together, that it mentions they came together on the Sabbath day. Notice they're coming to teach the word of God. But this is evangelism. This is teaching the lost. The day in which Christians, disciples are commanded to assemble together is not the Sabbath day, but we read in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, that it was the Christians that came together on the first day of the week. This is an example of evangelism. This is not an example of the church coming together for the purpose of, of praying and singing and the Lord's Supper is 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10 through 14 mentioned. This is evangelism to those who are lost. In Acts chapter 17, verse 1 through 3, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. So why did Paul go into them on the Sabbath? Well, that's because that's where the multitude of Jews came together. And how much easier is it talking to a group of people than going up to those individuals one at a time outside of that assembly, right? So Paul used this assembly as an opportunity to share with them all at once the teachings about the the suffering of the Christ and his resurrection from the dead. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days, right? Here's Paul with the Jews. Is he assembling with them on the Sabbaths to fellowship with them? No, he's not. He's assembling with them on the Sabbaths to reason with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Paul went into the synagogues on the Sabbath because that's where the multitude of Jews were, and it wasn't a fellowship with them, but it was to teach them. Acts chapter 18, verse 4, same thing. And he reasoned in a synagogue every Sabbath. Why? Well, because he was persuading the Jews and the Greeks. The New Testament has no law to observe the Sabbath day. The reason why the Christians in the first century were doing these things on a Sabbath was because that's where the Jews were and they were going to teach them. And you might even read Acts chapter 2, verse 40, is it 46? 
No. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. It's not just the Sabbath day that the Christians were trying to persuade the community to believe in Jesus Christ, but it was every day, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus. So just because you read about the Christians teaching on the Sabbath to Jews in the synagogue does not mean that the New Testament has a law for Christians to observe the Sabbath. All you're reading about is the Christians on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, teaching Jews, and they did that every day. It's just that on Saturdays, the multitude of Jews came together, so they went to where that multitude was and taught them. But they were teaching and preaching every day. The day in which Christians are commanded to observe under the New Testament is the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. This is a reference to the Lord's Supper. We learn that from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20 and 23. So here we read in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that the church is made up of disciples and the disciples are called Christians. And it says here, the disciples came together. What's that mean? Well, the church came together. The disciples came together, the first, or the Christians came together on the first day of the week, and here's the purpose why. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. The purpose they were supposed to come together was to eat the Lord's Supper, but they turned it into something else. So he's telling them, you're supposed to be coming together for the Lord's Supper, but from what I'm hearing, when you actually come together, you're not even partaking of the Lord's Supper, which is what they were supposed to come together for. In 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, to eat what? To eat the Lord's Supper. So the Christians were coming together to eat the Lord's Supper. And from Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we learn that's on the first day of the week. And there's also another commandment on the first day of the week. And that's to take up a collection from the members of the church for the work of the church. And it says here, concerning the collection for the saints. Now, the collection here is called for the saints. And some individuals, uh, the congregations in which they are members of, use those funds for um, providing for the needs of non-Christians. And the individual can, out of their own pocket, help provide funds for non-Christians. But the purpose of the collection on the first day of the week is for the saints. And there's three areas in scripture that we read the funds can be used. And one is edification for the body, for the members of the church, for the building up of the, the members of that church. Another is um, evangelism. And the last one is benevolence. And benevolence toward who? Well, benevolence toward the saints. And so this is a command on the first day of the week. Well, they would have already been coming together upon the first day of the week for the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And so this just helps establish the fact that it's the first day of the week in which Christians are coming together. Just because you read that Christians were teaching on Saturdays doesn't mean they were assembling together on Saturdays for the purpose of these things, because these commandments were upon the first day of the week. And the Christians left their homes and assembled together in one place, as 1 Corinthians 11 says, upon the first day of the week. Christians are commanded not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let us consider one another to provoke us unto love and the good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Well, when would they have been assembling together? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 20, verse 7 says the Christians assembled together on the first day of the week to eat the Lord's Supper. And this word, when it says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, we read about them assembling together for the purpose of eating the Lord's Supper. We have a phone call coming in. You're live. How you doing? Hey, how are you? I'm doing good this morning. How are you? Good. I'm just watching the show. Okay. Did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I'm. I'm fairly new to the Bible after avoiding it my entire life, and I'm, you know, a 
few verses and passages it might be a little confusing to me. Oh, is it verses that I went over or is there a certain verse which you have that you want us to go over right now to help clear up some confusion? Yeah, it's in, it's in Ezekiel. Um, there was uh, a, a, a passage that says, There she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emissions was like that of horses. And I don't know what that actually means. So Ezekiel twenty three twenty. Right, and what, it, what do they mean by emissions? So obviously, this is a woman uh, who is lusting after uh, lovers, which she should not be doing. And so, this is just individuals involved in sin, and God saying this is something which they should not have been involved in. And so, there's. Uh, it's an example, as it says in verse 19, she multiplied wh her whoredoms. And so verse 20 is an explanation of what's going on in their head that's causing them to lust and to, as it says in verse 19, playing the harlot. So God is just describing the perverseness of their mind because God created man and woman to be married, one husband, one wife. And so here's individuals lusting after multiple individuals. And so it's just an example of the sin in which they were involved in that they shouldn't have been involved in. So, but what is the difference between the omission of horses and that? Well, of man? so are you just calling, you're, you're just calling because uh, you already know the, the difference between those two. So are, is there an actual, you can look up the definitions of those if you want. So is there something else that I can help you with? Uh, what, what does the mission mean? All right. Yep, I appreciate that. Uh, don't let this troll take you off topic. Right, yeah, you just have an individual and they're just trying to... To be funny, and I went ahead and explained the verse. Yeah, you have this verse. If the listener is still listening in, you have this example of women lusting after multiple men and their lust, just as men, right? Men lust after women's private parts. And here is women lusting after what it says is, is private parts um, of other individuals. And so he's trying to get me to explain uh, the definition of, of men's private parts. And, and basically, as one of the examples is, is that a man was supposed to raise up children for his brother, and so he slept with his brother's wife because I was part of the law, but he spilled his seed. And so he actually didn't allow his children to be conceived in her womb. And so that's what that's talking about is the spilling of seed. And so just someone calling in to, I don't know, but that is a verse in the Bible, but to bring that up has nothing to do with the topic. And it's just an individual who's trying to, uh, I guess seek attention but if individuals out there were wondering about that verse there you go but don't let an individual uh just be perverted and focus on that verse you could look up the definitions for yourself what those things mean but we do have uh, a good study that we've been doing and it's regarding the sabbath day part of the old law and under the old law they were required to keep that sabbath but under the new testament the important day is the first day of the week Mark chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. The Sabbath was passed, so Saturday was over. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And so the first day of the week, Jesus was risen from the dead. It was after the Sabbath when the Sabbath was passed. So Jesus rose on the first day of the week. The day of Pentecost occurred on the first day of the week when the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And the day of Pentecost, as stated before, landed on the 50th day. And so it would have been on the first day of the week. The disciples met together on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, which is a reference to Christians partaking of the Lord's Supper, 
and the New Testament, the spiritual significance is on the first day of the week. So I, I appreciate y'all tuning in. If you're tuning in, you go ahead and say good morning. Or if you want to call in, it's 530-358-0400. And we can discuss the Bible live on video for the community to understand and see. Appreciate you, Glenn. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, uh, Dave Thornton, Stacy Thornton. And if you're if you if you want to assemble this first day of the week, you can go to Orville530.com and there is a link which says find a church of Christ near you. You can type in your area, your zip code, your state, and it will show you the congregations that are close to you that you can assemble with this coming first day of the week. Now, if you're not a Christian, I would recommend that you become one. In Mark chapter 15 or 16, verse 15 and 16, this tells us how an individual becomes saved. And it, Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature, right? There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Salvation is for those who obey Jesus, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. And in 2 Thessalonians 1.8, we read about those who do not obey Jesus. And it says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. And so either we can obey Jesus by faith or we can disobey Jesus. And it's not that under the New Testament, you have to obey Jesus perfectly. Right, Because under the New Testament, we have the forgiveness of sins. But it is the idea that we are called to obey Jesus to the best of our abilities. And, and God's grace will make up for what we lack. And the blood of Jesus was shed, as is stated, for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. This is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And in Acts 2.38, an individual is baptized for the remission of sins. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And those individuals who were baptized, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And it tells us the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So let's just calculate this formula of what occurs. An individual believes the gospel, they repent, they're baptized, they're added to the church Follow with me here. So these individuals who are baptized are added to the church. And these individuals who are members of the church are disciples who are called Christians. And these disciples, these Christians, assemble upon the first day of the week when the disciples come together to break bread. If you choose to become a disciple, right? If you just decide to become a Christian, a member of the church of Christ, then upon the first day of the week, this is a commandment given to us. And so I would like for you to become a Christian. If you live in the Orville community, uh, Butte County area, I'd love to have a Bible study with you. Uh, you can call in live and we can discuss the Bible together um, so the community can listen into the conversation. And really, this is a blessing. And, you know, you have individuals who who uh, are interested in God's word and you have in individuals who are not interested in God's word. And so in a Jude, in the book of or the letter written to Jude. This is what individuals, and this is, you know, individuals might call in and, and try to make a mockery of the Bible, try to make a mockery of Christian beliefs under the New Testament. It says that the Lord will come. Individuals think, well, he's not going to come. Well, the Bible says he will. And the only reason he hasn't yet is to provide you time, opportunity, time and opportunity to repent, to become a Christian. And it says the Lord will come to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so here's a characteristic of individuals who are, it says, ungodly, speaking ungodly things. And so we need to examine the motives of our heart because this day in which the ungodly are found out will not be a day 
of blessings for them. This will be the worst day and it will lead into an eternal day because eternity comes after the judgment. We as Christians, the body of Christ, this is a comment from Richard. We as Christians, the body of Christ, we want you to be saved. Jacob is giving you truth from the scriptures. Well, I appreciate that. And anytime I ever uh, don't share the truth, I've studied it uh, long enough to, to know uh, more than the basics. But if I ever do get off track and there is a verse which I am maybe taking out of context or or not sharing in a way that you share the same perspective, I would love to discuss it. As the Bible says, let's reason together. We can. And our goal as members of the body of Christ is to speak the same thing. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. This is what I want. I want us all to be Join together in the same mind and the same judgment so that based on our words, we can say amen. Now, if a person calls in and they say, you know what, Jacob? I agree that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, amen. We say the same thing. And it's not that, you know, you say the same thing as me and I say the same thing as you. And Jesus says another thing. But yet we should have unity with one another and who cares what Jesus says. That's not what this is about. This is about whatever Jesus has said, we want to say what he said, right? And that's how we have unity together. It's not unity outside of God's word. It's unity through God's word. And Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. I hope that you choose to obey this command today. A lot of people want a lot of evidence for for why they should believe uh, these teachings about Jesus commanding water baptism for the forgiveness of sins to be saved and evidence of only one church where all you have to do is read the Bible. You know, I, I read three verses and that convinced me. You have this, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I mean, plain and clear. You might ask the question, does a person have to be baptized to be saved? This verse lays it out pretty clear. It's not baptism only, but Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So if you believe in Jesus, that he died for your sins and rose again, Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. That word is a conjunction word and it can, it joins the two words together. And I also read Acts chapter two, verse 38, where he commands them to be baptized in order to receive the forgiveness of their sins. Those who received his word were baptized and look what it says. And they were added to the church, only one. There's only one church which Jesus purchased with his blood. And basically, this is just about it, which was able to convert me to believing that you have to be baptized to be saved and that Jesus only established one church. And now there's a lot more verses in there which talk about this thing. Jesus, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 said he would establish his church. He would build his church. And that's in the singular, only one. And by the time that we get to the new covenant, when the new covenant was set into force, there was only one church, just as Jesus had promised. There's only one body, just as Ephesians 4.4 4 states. I appreciate y'all for tuning in, and I hope you have a nice rest of your day. And uh, I, I created, at the end of this, it's about like a minute and a half little short clip. So I created an intro and an outro for all my videos. And... If you're tuning in, I appreciate you tuning in. And basically what the, the intro is just a two minute countdown to get individuals time to log in to see that I'm live. And the outro is showing individuals how to subscribe on, on each account. And also uh, I pay about $50 per month in advertisement and for this program. And so it's also uh, if you would like to donate, which I'm not asking for anyone's money. And but if you would like to donate, the money would just go for advertisement to this program. And so I've donated. Uh, I get from the, the congregation for preaching. Um, once a month, I receive some funds and I put all of those funds into this and. Um, I've paid so far. Let's see. I'll, I'll just show this. Thirteen dollars and ninety four cents uh, in the past like three days, and it has reached nine hundred ninety one people and thirty people. New people have liked the page, and so I'm investing funds 
an advertisement in hopes that more people in the community in the United States are able to see the broadcast, call in, have their Bible questions answered so that more individuals can become Christian. So um, I do take donations for that for advertisement. But again, I'm not asking for anyone's money. I want you more than anything to become a Christian and to, in your area, help share the truth with with members of your community so that they can be added to the body of Christ and assemble with you in your area. So you can ask people for Bible studies and that they will study with you. If they say no, guess what? There's nothing you could do. You did your job in trying to ask them if they're interested in a Bible study. And the Bible says that those who seek the Lord are those who are going to find him. Now, if a person's not seeking the Lord, uh, they're not going to find him because the person who comes to God must first believe that he is, that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that's in the book of Hebrews. Well, I appreciate y'all tuning in. Uh, God bless you. I hope you have a nice day, and I will see you tomorrow morning. On Facebook, in the search bar, type Bible Search Program. Click on the page, then click the like button. Press the three buttons, press following, and next to feed, click default, and change it to favorites. Next to posts, click highlights and change it to standard. Next to videos, click highlights and change it to all. Next to live videos, click highlights and change it to all. On YouTube, in the search bar, type Bible search program, then click subscribe. Press the bell button to set up the notifications. It might take you to your phone settings where you need to press notifications and toggle the switch to allow notifications. Then go back to the YouTube app and press the bell again, then select all. On Twitch, in the search bar, type Bible Search Program. Click Follow, then select the bell. It might take you to your phone settings where you need to press notifications and toggle the switch to allow notifications. Then go back to the Twitch app and press the bell so that it's no longer crossed out. On Twitter, in the search bar, type Call Me Live Now. On my profile page, press Follow, then select the bell. Afterwards, press Only Tweets with Live Videos. If you would like to support the program, and if you have the funds to do so, you can help promote this work for the kingdom by donating one time or more than one time, such as monthly. All funds donated go directly to advertisement only. I invest in my own personal funds, $50 per month. I keep none of the money donated, and it is spent immediately on advertisements only. If you'd like to donate via Facebook, Venmo, PayPal, Apple Cash, Google Play, Samsung Pay Cash, Check, Cash, or any other way, please comment, send a message, or text or call me so I can provide you with that information. My phone number is 530-358-0400. May God bless you as you search his word for truth. It's still playing, so... uh I didn't <laughs> I didn't know I was sitting here watching on my phone. Well, I hope y'all have a nice day and go ahead and get a hold of me if you have any questions or comments and we'll study God's word together.